What is up, ladies and gentlemen? We're officially live. I'm going to give people a minute to hop on the live show here. If you are watching the recording, sit tight. I'm going to get a few settings adjusted on this microphone here. I'm still trying to figure out the best settings I like for this thing. I'm going to wait for somebody to hop on live. And if you are live right now, can you comment below? I'm going to mess with some microphone settings. Let me know which one sounds better. This one is all auto set to near. So I have to be like here or I could do far, which sounds like this testing, 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 testing. Which one are you guys digging? This one, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. It may be a little echoey in here. We're in the process of our final days of cleaning out our second building here, migrating everything to building one. Uh, everything is off the walls and emptied right now. So <laughs> it's a little on the uh, echoey side. What's up, Steve? What's up, Linda? Welcome in, guys. If you don't mind doing me a favor, let me know. How audio is sounding. I'm going to switch over to manual mode real quick. And so I'm wearing the headphones. I got some music playing in here too, uh, which I much prefer, but I'm also going to be setting some settings on the microphone. Check one, two, check one, two, check one, two, check one, two. I don't want my gain up that high. Presence boost. We want the limiter. We want compression on medium. Ooh, there we go. All right. How's this setting compared to the auto? Now we are on manual mode, so I just mess with some settings on there, except for I don't want my mic gain up that high. <laughs> Dad, da, for what? How are you guys doing today? Oh, crack me a cold one. Sprite Zero, that is. Been focusing back on my health game, feeling phenomenal. Got that strength training dialed in, lifting heavy again. I'm going to raise my desk up real quick. All right, so let's get into the topic of the evening as long as, is microphone too, too high? This thing is adjusting my gain by itself and it's not supposed to. So hopefully the mic isn't too hot, I'm not picking up too much. Um, so somebody in the chat could just let me know real quick if we are good on this side. <laughs> Brianna's going to go shopping. <laughs> because we're liquidating our second building, I've got an insane amount, like three pallets worth of donation stuff. So our staff has been loving that. They get to go in and, and do some personal shopping every day. All right, so we're going to go ahead and dive into the topic of the night. I forgot that we're live on Facebook too. So let me open that up real quick because you guys know StreamYard. It just says, all right, Eugene, thank you. Just says Facebook user. So I want to make sure I get some names correlated to those two. So tonight I'm going to talk about um, building systems, the importance of consistency, all that good stuff. Just the, the proper way to scale business based on our experience. Of course, there's tons of ways. There's not just one. Um, I'm going to share some insights on our personal business. All right. I think we're good to go. So a couple things I want to start with. Number one is for those of you that are newer to the channel may not know exactly who we are, what we do. By the way, I forgot to mention Trista was in the thumbnail and she's not here. <laughs> Change of plans. Um, she's going to go hang with the kiddos. So you guys are stuck with me for the next hour. Um, and of course this is all Q and a style too, like every live show is. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to drop those in the chat. Um, tentatively as of now, we will be doing our regular live streaming show every single Wednesday, four to 5 PM Pacific time. Um, that may adjust to four 30. Not quite sure, but for sure, 4 or 4.30 every single Wednesday as of now is what we're going to stick with. So for those of you that are newer to, newer to the channel, uh, my name is Charles Leslie Chaz, as most people know me as. Uh, my wife Trista and I did the typical 
uh, success story, if you want to use that that terminology. Uh, you know, we hustled and grind, grinded in the garage, uh, selling stuff on Amazon, eBay for two years. And that was on top of our regular jobs. I was a massage therapist and personal trainer. She was in the medical field. Um, so we'd do our normal jobs. And then from 8 p.m. to midnight, sometimes past that, we would do the typical, uh, you know, sourcing products, listing on eBay, selling on Amazon, all that good stuff. We did that for two years out of there. Got our first little 500 square foot office space. Um, we got another office space that was slightly larger after that. And then now we are in our current space, uh, which is not massive by any means. It's about 2,000 square feet in building one, 2,000 square feet in building two. We're in the process of moving down to Texas. We covered that last week's show. Um, so that's left us with downsizing the Oregon prep center, um, which by the way, we've run a prep center. It's pretty much been like the career uh, that we've had over the last two years as we've scaled that up. And that's essentially what, what we're going to talk about tonight, is scaling up um, in regards to Amazon, eBay, what we've done as a prep center, uh, the do's and don'ts <laughs> in our own business that we've learned. So that's kind of like in a nutshell, the story that we we are in right now. So we're in the transition of getting down to Texas, which the last six weeks has really forced us to make a system and consistency out of every single thing that we touch under this roof. Um, and it's been the biggest learning experience that we've had out of anything that we've done. Um, and we've been self-employed for eight, I think we're going on eight years, seven, eight years. Uh, Trista quit her job, I think five years ago, actually say 26, 29th, I believe 28th or 29th coming up. I'll look on Facebook, see exactly how many years is when she um, quit her job. So pretty exciting times for us. And we're just happy to be back on social media and sharing um, the journey along the way. So a couple things I want to premise with is if you guys have not read the E-Myth by Michael uh, Gerber, I believe the, the last name is highly, highly, highly recommend reading that book. Personally, I don't think anyone should run a business without reading that book and at least getting some um, ideas from it. It's been the most impactful book that we've read. Um, and Trista's read it as well, but it's been the most impactful book that we've read um, as far as something that you've read and actually implemented because most people read tons and tons of books throughout their lifetime and rarely implement much. And that's been the one book that I think we've taken the most from and implemented the most from. Um, the whole premise is learning to work on your business um, and not just, you know, creating a job for yourself. Um, one of the, um, try to think of the, I forgot who it was. I, um, I was listening to somebody the other day on YouTube and they had mentioned, you know, if you run a plumbing business and you are the one going out on the calls and doing the plumbing, you, you don't have a plumbing business. You're, you're a plumber, right? You're being the technician um, and there's different terminology uh, that I'm going to use here. So technician is one of the terms within the E-Myth book. So you can be a technician and the business is going to rely on you. Now you can love being the technician in whatever uh, aspect that is for you and your business. You can love doing X, Y, Z, but your business is going to have a very tough time scaling and growing if it always relies on you. And that's the rat race we were stuck in for years. Um, Trist and I had to be here physically doing a lot of the the prep work and doing a lot of the ins and outs, um, being the ones that, that everyone turns to, right? Now we've created systems and put people in place to run those systems to where we don't have to touch um, the business on a day-to-day -day anymore. And that's allowing us to move down to Texas and still have our Oregon warehouse uh, running at full capacity. So in the whole plumber scenario, you know, obviously in that type of business model, you would then hire plumbers underneath you, tra uh, train them the way that you'd want things done under that business model, et cetera. The whole premise is to not get into business for yourself so that you can be the one that is, that is the technician of every single thing that you touch. The point of being an entrepreneur is to create a system that, pr that provides the service, right? You, yes, in the beginning, you have to be the technician. You have to put in the, the hours. Uh, every single entrepreneur that I know, including ourselves, we spent years doing the 10, 12 hour days, putting in the work, building the foundation until we got to the point where we start thinking in larger terms of scaling um, and then looking at how can we create systems around everything we do and how can we outsource those, whether it's to a virtual assistant or a physical staff member. 
um, and start building that way. So the goal of uh, being an entrepreneur, it's not just to build your own business. In order to build your own business, you need, you need to create the system that's going to be run. Um, you know, whether most of, most of the time I'm, I'm referring to staff. So it's going to be run by staff that can then produce the service without you needing to be the one that does the hands-on work every single day. Um, it's fun for a while. Um, I think in terms of, you know, my former career was a massage therapist. I went through the same type of grind in that career too. I, at one point I did work for traditional company companies, um, you know, worked for a big five-star spa, all these fancy things. Then I wanted to get out of that rat race and I knew that I was capping myself at making 40, $45 an hour as a massage therapist working for someone else. I knew that if I quit and went self-employed, I can then charge 65 to $75 per hour for that service. Now, the thing I didn't know back then was how much work I would have to do on the marketing to get my clients. But point being, when I went self-employed, I was the massage therapist that provided the, the service. I was a solopreneur, right? It was just me by myself, renting space, working on my clients. Now, looking back with the knowledge I have now, what I wish I would have done is then put myself in a position to where I can rent a larger space that had separate rooms to where I can then have other massage therapists pay rent to me um, and they would be 1099 contractors. I could have scaled that out tremendously if I had put in the time to learn about scaling a business properly and not just being the entrepreneur by myself putting in the grind. Um, I look at it in terms, and I've seen this you know, in tons of different places from different people, but it usually boils down to you have three different types of phases that you can grow through. So you have entrepreneur or solopreneur at you by yourself. And a lot of our audience is obviously based on reselling. So a lot of this is going to be in terms of Amazon and eBay selling Poshmark, et cetera. You usually start by yourself in your garage, your spare bedroom, a corner of a living room somewhere, buying and selling and listing and shipping products. At some point, when you start to make $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month, 5K a month, et cetera, that solopreneur journey then becomes more of an actual business for yourself. You start to make real legitimate money. Not that making a hundred bucks or 200 bucks here is not real money, but hopefully you guys understand where I'm coming from with that. You start to get to the point where this is turning in to an actual business income where we're talking about thousands of dollars per month being made or per week. Then the next phase is when you start to hire staff when you start to hire virtual assist assistants uh for those of you resellers and you know especially here in prep center world we need physical staff to run the systems here right i can't hire virtual assistants for a uh, virtual assistant for five bucks an hour in the philippines to come prep products here <laughs> um, i've got to pay a lot more than five bucks uh an hour to get anyone under uh, uh this roof uh, especially in today's day and age it takes a lot more money to get people to get off their butts and work right so the whole premise is you start as an entrepreneur that's by yourself, solopreneur style, putting in the hustle and the grind. Then you become an actual business, whether you create an LLC for yourself, you start to hire, hire a virtual assistant, maybe you hire friends and family to come help you list and prep and uh, ship or do your photos. That's getting into more like, okay, now we're a business. And then when you become the next, the third phase is going to be, okay, now we're a company. A company is where you now have to hire for dedicated roles and positions and departments, right? Start dealing with a lot more staff. You start dealing with HR. Uh, maybe you get into an actual payroll system where they're not just 1099 contractors. You pay PayPal and then they take care of their own taxes. Now they're on actual payroll as W-2 employees. That's becoming an actual company, right? So now that we've been through all three of these phases, looking back, I, I kick myself as a massage therapist for not scaling in that direction. My life could have been in a completely different place if that had happened, right? Um, but since I can't go back and change our past, mine and Trista's, because she has you know her own her own thoughts on where she could have ended up if we knew what we knew now. And since we can't go back and change anything, the least we can do is at least pop up on YouTube. Uh, and TikTok and Instagram and just share a little bit of our insight and our experience and hope that it inspires somebody to take action, 
change the direction that they're going and try to do things more efficiently. That's ultimately why we are even on social media or doing videos. Um, I can tell you first and foremost, we do not make thousands of dollars a month. We did at one point through social media and YouTube, uh, when we were hammering out, you know, three to five videos a week, every single week and putting in that grind, um, uh, this YouTube channel brings in like 200 bucks a month right now, uh, which I, you know, obviously that was a painful, uh, transition that happened, but ultimately it was, I think one of the best things as far as content goes for us, because I have zero financial incentive to get on here and do videos anymore. Um, so that that really put me in a position of I genuinely want to be here um, for you guys, right? I'm not doing this for for a couple of grand a month uh, for ad revenue, et cetera. That's great and fun and I'll take it when it comes, but <laughs> um, I'm just happy to be able to share our experiences uh, with you guys, especially right now in this moment in time, we're in such a crossroads in our life with moving to Texas, having our Oregon warehouse still running as a prep center, and starting a new warehouse um, operation down there um, as a prep center. And we're still going to be doing eBay, still doing our own Amazon selling. Um, so it's almost like starting from scratch down, down in, um, I almost said Arizona, Texas. <laughs> so lots and lots of thoughts in the midst of all these transitions and changes going on in our lives right now. So that's why I want to get on here and just talk more about the systems that helped us kind of get there. And of course, if you guys have questions along the way, feel free to drop those in the comments below. Um, and then we'll do just kind of general Q and a here, um, in a few, let me hit a couple of these comments real quick. Uh, Gretchen said, we tell our employees, Oh, let me highlight this. I keep forgetting. It's been too long. I, I can actually highlight comments. We tell our employees, the more, you know, the more you can pay you exactly. They actively look for more ways to learn about the business, you know, it is man staff is a whole nother ball game. Once you get to that, that level. Um, and that's so true is, you know, we, we've explained that to a couple of them, um, that the more value you bring to a workplace, not just our, our company, but the more value you bring anywhere, the more that you're going to make, that's just, that's how it is. Um, and I, I hope more people understand that, um, as we move forward and like build a bigger center down in Texas and hire more people, et cetera. Uh, that's spot on level up thrift. What is up, man? Your YouTube video on reselling RA at Ross was the second video I had ever seen on reselling inspired my ass on the move. Did you guys look at any other states to relocate before choosing Texas? Um, we, at some point before kids, we legitimately were looking at Florida actually. So Florida was in the works um, until Trista got pregnant. That changed everything. First grand grandbaby. So we couldn't I ripped the grand grandbaby away from the grandparents for the first timers. Um, and then at some point before we landed on Texas, Arizona was actually in the mix or I guess in talks. Um, our whole family was looking to migrate. It's not just Tristan. And I, our whole family was looking to migrate somewhere sunny. Uh, we all grew up here in Oregon and are sick and tired of six months of rain and gloom and seasonal depression. Just done with it. Right. Um, so that's ultimately how we ended up on Texas. Now they've all migrated down there on um, the rest of her family. So we're the last ones, uh, to make that jump. Ah, there you go. Nice. Uh, let me look at the live chat, see who this was from. All right. It's not showing me who, who messaged this. Oh, now it is Paul. What's up, man? Love Texas spent nine years at Fort hood. Awesome, man. So let's dive into more of my bullet points here. Ultimately, everything that we talk about comes down to this. Don't build a business that relies on you. Yes, you will have to do that in the beginning, right? No business was built just by, hey, I have an idea. Let me go start an LLC and just immediately hire all the staff that I need. And all, magically, the whole thing's going to work, right? You have to be the one that builds the foundation. You have to be the one that builds the systems. You have to know the ins and outs of every single thing that you touch. Um, Cause as you grow and you hire staff, there's all kinds of spinning plates happening that you may not even know they're getting ready to fall until you try to give that to a staff member. Um, and then you give something else to another staff member. There's lack of communication somewhere and then things fall and break, right? You learn this as you go. But ultimately, as you scale your job, and this is just my 
experience, in my opinion, by the way, there's more than one way to build a business. Do I don't want anyone sharing this video with one of their entrepreneur friends or like, oh, can you believe this guy says that this is the, the only way? There's not an only way. This is just the way that we've done things. Let me let me get that uh, crystal clear. <laughs> Build a business that doesn't rely on you. That's been our personal goal as CEOs of our own companies now uh, since the beginning. We love reselling, right? We love to be in the stores, in thrift stores, garage sales, um, even just going through wholesale catalogs. I just went through a catalog earlier today um, for a bunch of different products. I love that part, right? And I think most of us in the reselling space can say that we get into reselling because we love the sourcing. I don't think anyone absolutely loves the shipping, loves the listing. Like you can enjoy it to an extent. Like I actually enjoy eBay shipping, but I don't love it nearly as much as I love the sourcing. I think that's the same for most people. Uh, so the goal is to get to the point where you get to do the parts of the business that you love because you genuinely want to do them, not because it becomes a job you created for yourself. So create a system that is run by staff. Typically, it's going to be staff or a program or a software. There's ways you can outsource that. For example, if you're in the Amazon world, you have something called a repricer, which is automatically going to adjust your prices based on your minimum ROIs. Uh, you can set um, the caps that it will go at, it, you know, highs, lows, et cetera. You can tell that repricer how to reprice your product. So you don't have to go in there several times a day and physically reprice things. That was one quick way that we can save tons of hours per month. Um, so that's an example of not necessarily a you know physical staff or a virtual assistant that we hire. That's an example of a piece of software uh, that can help you outsource and save yourself some time. So you ultimately need to just keep that in mind as you scale, as you grow. You're thinking of the way you can systemize everything. Your end game, at least in our world, was always to be in a position where the business doesn't have to rely on me. If something goes wrong in the business, I should have someone in place that knows exactly how to fix it. Or even better, everyone on our staff uh, is cross-trained, for example, which means if something goes wrong, everyone has generally the same amount of knowledge um, in our staff. Of course, we have a, we have ultimately a manager um, and an assistant manager at this point. Um, so there is a tier system to it, like a traditional company, but ultimately everyone in, under our roof is cross-trained. Um, because we've, we've tested out, you know, one person is trained just on this, one other person is trained just on this and kind of separate out those roles. Not that there's anything wrong with that. You can definitely create a, a system around that. We just did trial and error. We found what worked best for us was to cross train everyone on, on everything that they would need to know. Um, ultimately that was, that was the way that we got to the point where the business now doesn't rely on us. The parts that rely on us now are more technical things like, Hey, my printer isn't working, right? The technical aspects. Um, and that's something that we're working on and before we leave. We're going to create, uh, you know, videos for those more technical things like printers not working or the, you know, the dymo not formatting correctly, <laughs> all those tiny things. So keep that in mind, build a business that doesn't rely on you. You should have the flexibility and the freedom in your own business to do the parts of it that you love. And if you love sourcing, but you can't get out and source as much as you want to because you're stuck doing photos and listing and shipping, chances are it's time for you to outsource one of those aspects so you can save time to then reinvest that time back into more sourcing, which brings you more product, which brings you more listings, which brings you more revenue. Like it's, it's just a natural progression that happens right there. So what are the tasks in your business? This is a question that you should start with. If we're talking like, I want to, a lot of you have probably got the whole aspect of creating systems in your business, but I want to talk real quick to the people that are still just putting in the hustle and the grind by themselves in a corner of a spare bedroom or the garage. And you're getting to that point where you have way more inventory than you can handle. You want to go out and source more because that's the fun part, but you're stuck doing all the grunt work, right? I want to talk to that group real quick. So ask yourself the question, what are the tasks 
in your business that make the entire thing run. Quick shout out to Mr. Christopher Grant, one of my favorite humans in the world. What are the tasks in your business? Now, of course, there's way more than the ones I'm going to list right now. These are just like the, the pillars of, of each business style. I'm going to talk about Amazon eBay because I feel like that's 95% of our audience here. So with eBay, the five main pillars, and again, my personal opinion based on, on our own business, when I look at my eBay business, the five main pillars are sourcing, photos, listing, inventory management, or storage, you know, either way, and shipping. Those are like the five main pillars. Of course, there's unlimited uh, rabbit trails on each one that you can break down. But ultimately, those are the five main pillars. Those are the five main tasks that make my eBay business run as well as yours. Now, if you have other things that make your eBay business run, um, such as cleaning and testing, I did not put that on my list. So that could be six. I did not put that on my list because I don't really source uh, stuff that needs cleaned and tested anymore. I used to do a ton of electronics. Those of you that follow our channel know I used to do a lot more used electronics. So I spent a lot of time, hours per day, testing and cleaning, uh, repeating uh, that process. So that leaves us with our five main pillars. Now, if you are following along, like I want this to be a little bit of an active, consider this your workshop for the evening. Get a notepad on your computer, your phone, piece of paper, something. If you need this, and this is information that you're like, wow, I really should sit down and do this. Like do that shit now. Too many of you listen to these videos, whether it's mine or other content creators, and you think, wow, that's a great idea. And you don't do shit with it. That's a problem. That's probably the reason why you aren't scaling as quickly as you want to. Take the time right now to get what you need to get in order to sit down and follow along here. Some of you can sit down and do this task right now with me and write this stuff down to get the ball rolling, which then gets your consistency flowing. And then you can, you can get to that point of scaling and uh, outsourcing. So ask yourself, what are the tasks that you that run your business? I listed my five for my eBay business. Some of you have, may have some others. Um, so what are the tasks? Sourcing photos, listing, inventory management, and shipping are mine. So what am I going to do to try to systemize this? First and foremost, write out a checklist for how you do each of those. And if you're taking notes, I'll give you a second. And in between this downtime, if you guys have questions, pop those in the chat and I'll go through and answer some questions for you guys too. So you need to acknowledge what are the pillars of your business that make it run? What are those major tasks that need to get done? <laughs> What's up, Adam? Who this? New phone. Hope you're doing well, my friend. So you need to write out a checklist. It doesn't matter if that shit's on a whiteboard, on a notebook. It doesn't have to look pretty and fancy. Progress or not progress, <laughs> going to my fitness trainer days. I say this all the time, but in a, in a fitness standpoint, done is better than perfect. Done is better than perfect. And that phrase right there will literally change some lives if you let that hit home for you. Don't focus on, I need to have a clean looking notepad before I can write things. Like whatever the case is, just write down a checklist for how you do each thing. What do I mean by that? Let's take sourcing, for example. If I was, and it's funny, I should do a YouTube, now I just had this idea. I should do a YouTube series because I'm actually going to be doing this. So when you write out a checklist of how you do things, ask yourself this, how would I train one of my parents to do eBay? How would I train one of my friends to do eBay? So each of us have our own unique specific ways that we're looking up comps. We have our own parameters. Some people don't touch products that don't sell for at least $30. Like you need to write all of this down. What are your parameters? So when I'm sourcing first, so let's look, let's look at it this way. 
if I'm teaching, and I say this because I am going to be teaching my mom in and out of uh, ins and outs of how to run eBay. Um, I just sent over like 50 items to her house um, and we're, we're sending over tables and tape guns. Like we're going to get them set up my parents with with the whole eBay operation. So I have to train them from scratch, right? So when I'm going to teach them how to source, all I can teach them is what I know. So I know that my habits are when I walk into a Goodwill and this is kind of like a little exercise for those of you that are actually taking notes right now, ask yourself when I go into a thrift store, what are the first three stops I make? And if you only have one category you source, totally fine, right? What brands are you looking for? What are the first things you're looking for? And I'm going to beeline to the electronics. Um, typically, I'm looking for the higher end electronics. Doesn't need much for cleaning or testing, etc. So that's the first place I'm going to beeline. Electronics. I'm then going to go check out some shoes. I'm going to check out some clothing. Either I don't do a ton of clothing, but um, I usually browse through. For the rare instance, I might ever find something vintage up here in the Portland area that's not priced at $50 or something. <laughs> Another reason I'm excited to get down to Texas, cheaper thrifting. So you're going to write down what are the three types of products I'm looking for right away. And when you identify one of those products, what are you looking for? What types of flaws are you looking for? Um, if it's an electronic, you pick up the electronic you're interested in, then what? You flip it around, find the model number, look it up on eBay, filter to sold comps. You literally need to write this down step by step as if you are training someone who has zero clue what they're doing. Write that down for all of your categories. And I'm doing a lot of this off the top of my head. I literally just have basic bullet points and then I'm just going to rabbit trail. So step one, if you're actually paying attention right now, if you are actually going to implement anything I'm talking about, and I hope one person does and they message me after this, shoot me a picture of your notepad or whatever you jotted down. I would love to see someone taking action with this right now. Step one to creating a system within your business is you need to write a step-by-step -step checklist of everything, everything you touch, how to do it, what you're looking for, et cetera. Um, especially when you get into like photos, how do you take your product photos? Do you have five different angles you hit every single time. Um, you know, little things like use square mode, use the contrast up button to make a brighter picture and a wider background, like little tiny things like that. Write that down as if you are teaching someone who has no idea what they're doing. Uh, especially when you get into like the listing and the inventory management and the shipping, there's all kinds of different information um, as far as everything involved with that. With that. Everyone does it slightly different. So write a checklist down for all of your topics. Um, that's for eBay. If we're talking Amazon, you've got sourcing, right? Sourcing is a huge category in the Amazon space, right? Because you have private label, you have wholesale, um, you have retail arbitrage, you have online arbitrage. There are so many rabbit trails off each of those four sourcing methods that uh, that you can you can imagine. So when we're talking about Amazon, you have sourcing. Spread, I put spreadsheet as just a general like inventory management. So the problem that I faced early on was I had zero, I still don't have many organizational skills. <laughs> I'm naturally just a, a cluttery, just not organized person, uh, which I've learned to accept. It's fine. So in the beginning, I struggled with, I would go out and just buy, right? So I, I did a lot more retail arbitrage than any other business model. So I just go out and just load up my carts, bring it all back to the garage or, or our office space. And when I went to go actually do my shipment, I ran into a problem. And I went to check the product in an inventory lab where you can put in your supplier, which is usually pretty easy for me to remember. And then it got to the buy cost. Then I went, oh, crap, how much did I pay for this? And then I would have to go filter through all the different receipts. Um and try to figure out what my buy cost was for that. If I had kept some type of just basic spreadsheet that literally from your phone, you can have Google Sheets on your phone um, and just make little edits as you shop. So I paid this much for this item. Um, you can put what date that you bought it, et cetera. So when you do your shipment, all your information is right there on a spreadsheet. It's a basic inventory um, tracker. And 
I had, I had never even done that until like three years in until I got so sick and tired of just my shipments taking way too long because I was always looking for buy costs. <laughs> so you really need to hone in and get some type of spreadsheet set up for yourself. Um, so when you do your Amazon shipment that you need that buy cost info, it's just right there. Even if you want to go as far as like when you scan it in the store, you can just copy the ASIN right there and drop it in. So you have your ASIN you're going to use, all that kind of stuff. Um, then, then you get into inventory lab. So inventory lab is another huge pillar. Um, I think most Amazon sellers probably use inventory lab. Uh, we use it here at the prep center. So you get into inventory lab, all kinds of training that needs to be done for that, for someone who has no idea what they're doing, but still make a checklist for each thing, right? What type of specific settings are you using? Are you using live mode to use private batch? Like you need to write all of this stuff down in a checklist form so that when you get to the point where you can train someone else to take over that task for you, everything's done. It's in a list. Um, if they have any questions, they can refer to the checklist first. If, if the question is not answered on there, then they can ask you, right? It's getting them to learn how to be resourceful um, at the same time. And then you have Amazon prep, right? All kinds of different condition guidelines that go into that prep guidelines, uh, requirements, et cetera. How do you do box contents? How do you manage your Amazon returns, your store returns? If you did OA and stuff comes in box damage, what's your process for doing um, a return? So that's, that's kind of my main pillars in the Amazon space uh, that we deal with. So that's just something I would highly recommend that you really hone in um, and get your, 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 um, your list written out for every single item there. And if you are like, I literally just stop the video now if I need to, because that alone will help a lot of you just get the ball rolling with creating a system in your business. When you're, when you're new, when you've been doing the solopreneur thing, it's not like you make a list and then boom, I can just step back and just go source. And then somehow the shipping will take care of itself. This is going to take a lot of time um, and patience of training people to get the right people in the right place with the right role. Some people that you hire are awesome at taking photos and they suck at shipping. Like <laughs> you need to focus on hiring people for specific roles based on their strengths too. Like, even though I say everyone is cross-trained here at the prep center, which they are, certain people are better at certain tasks. So we make sure that they are plugged in uh, where their strength is. Enter death pile. <laughs> All right, let me hit quick break time. Get some questions answered. What's up, Charles Taylor? I love that name. Let's see. I'm the janitor, shipper, maintenance man, accountant, lister, buyer, customer service rep. I am the geek squad. <laughs> Reminds me of, um, you know, you see those. Uh, I've seen a couple of people do it on TikTok and different videos where someone's like, oh, hold on. Let me transfer you over to accounting. Hello, accounting. <laughs> uh, yeah, same premise. And it's... You know, I mentioned this earlier, you're going to be doing that grind for a while in the beginning. And some people like myself, I did that for years until I read the E-Myth. And that's where we really honed in and hit the hit the gas pedal on hiring people um, so that we can get our sanity back in our lives and not work 12 hour days. Alexander, what's up, my friend? Building Target furniture for the liquidation store as I listen to this. That's awesome. I'm excited. Shoot me over a text. I want to see some updates on how everything's going with that. Adam, what happens when you're like me? You need to make a list to remind you to look at the other reminder to look at the list. ADD sucks sometimes with stuff like that. 100% man. I diagnosed ADHD, ADD. <laughs> I, I completely understand that. Sadly, this has been very true. Message him and he will get back to you in two to seven business months. Business, uh, busy guy. <laughs> you know, I had a conversation with my buddy Jake about this. It's I have a, it's hard to even put into words. Some people understand it. Some people don't. Some people think I'm just a dick for never replying back. I, I mean, I can't exaggerate about this. I have a thousand two hundred and forty text messages. That's not even going to focus. So I have 1,240 unread text messages right now. And that's not recently. That's just over, over the last year or so. Uh, it's not that I don't love the people that are trying to reach out and message. It's I have, I have very, it's, it's not even that I'm busy, right? I'm not any busier than, than anyone else that's here, right? We've all got busyness in our lives. 
I just have a very hard time replying back to people instantly. It's kind of like when I, when I'm ready to reply back, that's when people get replies. Um, yeah, Adam, one of those is probably yours. Uh, shoot me a reminder text and uh, I'll get back to you. So do, I hope anyone who's ever texted me, like, do not take offense if I don't reply back. It has nothing to do with you. Mo like 80% of the time, I've literally forgotten after a couple days. Um, so if that ever happens, feel free to shoot a reminder text. Uh, so it bumps it back up to the top. But yeah, some people understand where I'm coming from with that. Some people don't. That's okay. I've learned that I don't need to justify myself to anyone anymore. And that's a very powerful mindset shift I've had really in the last year. Uh, it's been incredibly healthy for me mentally to just unplug and not feel the urge and the need to give, 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 give. Um, God, it sounds horrible now I say it out loud, but I don't know. It's been a very powerful mental shift I've had uh, to help me keep my sanity. Oh, no. Gretchen caught the big C last week. Realized at 2 p.m. that first day of quarantine that I wasn't there to ship Walmart orders. Martin had to run two big boxes to UPS, so we weren't late. Oh, man. Oh, I hope you are feeling much, much better. That yeah, that crud's making its rounds right now. Going on 11 years, I have hit that wall. I want to grow and add employees. So I don't have to do every little thing. And the last employee I hired, I caught stealing from me scary stuff. That's that's probably the number one thing about hiring employees that's the most difficult is just trust. When you, especially when you're hiring someone from scratch, you have you don't know who they are, right? We we've done our interviews in coffee shops um, when we had our first tiny little like 500 square foot office space. Uh, we did our interviews with potential staff members in, in coffee shops and you can like someone in an interview. The problem is we've hired and hired and fired enough people by now because we're, you know, several years into this, we've hired and fired enough people to realize first impressions really don't do much. We've had employees that were amazing for a couple months and then the true colors came out and the laziness and the constant I'm going to be 15 minutes late. I can't come into work today. Like all that kind of stuff piles up and then you really get to see how people are. But learning to build trust with employees is it's a very difficult thing. I have no magic answer for it. Um, it's just one of those things that trust is just going to be built over time. Never outsource important tasks to new employees. If if I've learned anything, that's, that's one of my rules. Um, we start them bare bone, basic prep. I'm talking like stuff that does not even need a poly bag. It's just a box. Like they start prepping that they do that, right? Okay. Here's some multi-pack vitamins. You can poly bag these together. <laughs> okay. You got that down. Okay. Let's go into some three pack stuff. Um, all right. Once they got prepped down and they've been here for several months, they've got it. They're quick. They're reliable. Okay. Let's get you on inventory lab and, and teach you some of that stuff. There's a tier to how we train people. Um, and that's a whole nother topic we can cover in a different video is, is training employees, um, on those tasks. All right, back to my little list here. So ask yourself, if you don't have any systems within your business, it's just you showing up and hustling and grinding. Um, and I put this in the description when I was writing out the uh, caption for this video. It's, how do I phrase this? Now that I can look back and reflect on our journey as entrepreneurs, business owners, and now running a, an actual company with staff and roles and departments, it was easy to show up 12 hours a day and hustle and grind and just make money. I'm not saying that it wasn't extremely difficult to work those long hours, but big picture, looking back, I can see how easy it was just to show up, put in put in the time, put in the work and make money. But that's not scalable. The business was relying on me and Trista because if we didn't show up and put in those hours, things didn't get shipped out. Things didn't get photoed. Things didn't get listed. Things didn't get sourced. So, of course, you have to do that in the beginning, like I said before. But when I look back, I'm like, man, that was easy just to show up by myself and grind for 10 to 12 hours and make money. Now that 
we've progressed along and we have staff, we can now see <laughs> that was not efficient at all. And there's no way that we scaled and grew to where we are now. We're by no means large sellers. Our prep center is still a baby in the big sea of prep centers, but I'm damn proud of the progress that we've made over the last several years. And you guys here on YouTube have access to all the videos along the way. We have videos as far back as our garage days. Um, we have a inside one of the vlogs, you guys saw like when we first signed our first lease for a 500 square foot spot, we were so pumped. And there was a lot about those days that seemed like they were so easy compared to how it is when you start to create systems um, and scale that way. So number one thing, if, you, if you're still in that hustle and grind mode, you need to write out this list, um, this to, not to-do list, um, sorry, you need to write out the tasks, right? Those pillars of each, each side of your business. And then you need to make a checklist, a step-by-step -step way that you do that task. Now, this will probably start in written form, which it should. Then if you get to the point of hiring a virtual assistant or even a staff member, yes, you can you can train them yourself in person. That's obviously going to be a huge benefit because a lot of people are visual hands-on learners. Highly recommend that. But have a reference guide that's written out for them to follow so that after, because I'll tell you this, after training many people on our staff, it doesn't matter how well you train them. Most people are going to forget. So they may come back in two weeks like, hey, how do you do that thing? How do you restore a batch on inventory lab? How did you change that printer setting? Like even if you showed them, they're probably going to forget at some point because there's just a lot of stuff you're going to throw at an employee. So have a checklist that they can reference first before coming to you. Now, once you have that checklist done, one step further is you can use a program like Loom to do a screen recording where you can physically or visually show them, click here, do this, right? Um, so I highly recommend that you have a video paired with a written checklist. Um, and if you want to embed that on like some type of website or a notepad just for your team, highly recommend that. So next, now that you've kind of gotten the idea of how we've been able to create systems around everything that we do, now we need to look at creating the consistency around those systems, especially when you get to the point that if you are going to hire more than one employee, everything needs to be run like a franchise. Another huge point of the E-Myth book that I recommend you read. Everything should be run like a franchise. What does this mean? You can go to a McDonald's in Florida and you can go to a McDonald's in Oregon, get a Big Mac, and they're probably going to be made the same way because there is a very specific system and a consistency to how that system is run, right? So start to think about your business in that sense. If you had two different locations for your business, would things be run the exact same way or would they be run based on the staff member that's running that? Everything should have a written system to it and everything should be outsourced in a way that that consistency is going to be there. Um, if you're running two different eBay locations, two different warehouses, let's say two different states, and you have a minimum for your business to get 20 listings a day up, non-negotiable, at the end of the day, you should be able to see 20 new listings up um, the exact same way that uh, they were processed the exact same way um, at the end of the day. So that's something to really hone in and think about is running your business like a franchise. Once you get the systems in place, then the game of consistency really starts to play. And that's where it gets to be difficult and tough is creating habits and consistency. Easiest way to do this is literally make yourself a schedule. Um, it's When you get to the point of having a warehouse, dumb things like, oh, we're out of paper towels. Well, if I had a system around paper towels, we would never run out. So now we have a system for paper towels that when someone grabs the last uh, roll, it's put on a checkbox on our supplies chart. It's put on a checkbox that, okay, manager on our way in tomorrow needs to go grab paper towels. Or if you want to order them online, just look at the delay time. Let's say your minimum is when you run down to your, you know, last three rolls of paper towel towels, because you know, it takes four to five days to get here for a new order. Okay. I'm down to my, my third roll checkbox that on a supplies chart and then boom, I'll go put my order in and then it's here before they run out. Create a schedule around stuff 
it will save you so many headaches and it gets you to be on point and consistent. Um, it's you know, running a warehouse. Like we've got to have a schedule for cleaning the bathroom. How often do we sweep? How often do we sanitize the laptop keyboards? Like there's got to be a written schedule down for this kind of stuff, or it just kind of like gets done every now and then, or when you feel like it, it's just like those, you know, from my fitness background, I can kind of bring that point in here too. It's the clients that I had that lost 50 pounds didn't show up and eat right and drink a lot of water and sleep more when they felt like it. I had them on a schedule. They, they worked out five days a week. They walked seven days a week. They ate a certain amount of calories and a certain amount of protein day in and day out. They followed a schedule, which ultimately led to their success. The clients that didn't have success with the plans that I gave them, it's not because it was a bad plan. The plan wasn't followed. I gave the schedule for them and they didn't follow it. They weren't consistent. And so they didn't get the result. Look at um, look at the fact that, so I'm going to be doing like a podcast series coming up. Uh, my first one's getting recorded this weekend. I tried to record it like a month ago when we first started the year, but some of you on Instagram saw my microphone literally broke during the recording. So that, that kind of set me back. <laughs> Point being, I'm going to record this around this topic that we're at the end of January right now. Most people statistically have either quit or not even started towards their goals that they set, the resolutions. Think about that. Year after year, people keep saying, I want to do this big thing. And then they don't create any type of schedule or activities or anything that will get the needle to move towards that goal. So right now, going into February is a notorious time that in the gym, all of a sudden, wow, there's only half the amount of people that were here two weeks ago. What happened? They probably just stop being consistent at some point during their journey. And all of a sudden they only go when they feel like it. You can have temporary results by showing up when you feel like doing things, but only for so long. And I think most of you here probably want to scale your business to some degree. That might be just making a thousand dollars profit per month, which can change a family's life. It changed ours. That first $1,000 profit in a month is a huge milestone. So some of you, that is your goal. That is your big dream is just to make 1000 bucks a month to take your family on a once a year vacation or to pay down your, your credit card debt, buy a house. 1000 bucks a month can do all that. So some of you want to go to $50,000 a month. You want to be those you know big seven and eight figure sellers. Great. But the problem is you won't ever get there if you don't have a consistent schedule that you are following in your business. And that includes all the pillars. All that needs to be consistent. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of trial and error, <laughs> a lot of experience to get to the point where you can actually master all those, right? Uh, we're by no means perfect and we have tons of room to grow, but we're in a way better position now than we were a year ago and a year before that. That's why I get very irritated with a lot of people this time of year because I check in. I'm like, Hey, how's that? How's that resolution coming along? And like, Oh man, I haven't, you know, I went to the gym for those first like five days and I was sore and I stopped going and I just haven't been back in since. What are you doing? You've got to show up. That is over half the battle in business and health and fitness weight loss. That's half the battle of life is showing up. If more people just showed up consistently, you'd probably be a lot further along in your life than you are now. That can literally be something as simple as if you want to lose weight, don't change anything in your diet, but just start walking 10 minutes a day. If you just show up and just walk the 10 minutes a day and maintain your, your current diet, you will start naturally losing a little bit of weight over time. It's not much. We're only talking 10 minute walk here. But it's something, it teaches you the consistency of showing up, and that is over half the battle. So if you want to be at a point in your business where you're selling 
5,000, 10,000, $50,000 a month in your business, you've got to start showing up and doing the small things first. And I posted this on Instagram several times. So many people say they want to achieve these big businesses, but they can't even get consistent with achieving the consistency in the small tasks. If you can't show up and be consistently listing five items a day on eBay, how do you ever expect to become a large eBay seller? If you can't become consistent at sending in a certain amount of inventory to Amazon every week, you can't expect to ever become a consistently large seller. You've got to be consistent with these small things that lead up to the bigger successes within your life and your business, whatever goal you're trying to achieve. That's the name of the game right there is just showing up, being consistent. Once you achieve having a step-by-step -step list of how you accomplish your tasks in your pillars in your business, once you start to create a schedule around how you do everything, whether that's Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, I am committing to going to five stores and sourcing or doing online arbitrage. I'm going to commit to 30 minutes of online arbitrage five days a week. You need to create a schedule around this stuff. Um, you know, your shipping, are you going to have one day handling time in your eBay business and do daily shipping? Or are you going to ship every other day? You need to come up with these schedules that create the consistency around that. Once you have that all down, then you are in a position to, for the rest of your life, always be looking for ways to improve your systems. Then you get into the lean manufacturing concepts, right? Even better is if you start with lean manufacturing, then you're going to save yourself a ton of headaches <laughs> or at least save yourself a lot of time. So lean manufacturing, I'm not going to get into it here. The tons of videos, go watch Paul Aker's uh, YouTube channel and all the other videos out there on lean manufacturing. But then you can start to look at the systems that you made, your foundation. Then again, done is better than perfect. They don't need to be perfectly laid out systems. You don't have to have all 18 bullet points written out for every single thing. Just start with something. Get some type of outline of your business put together, some type of blueprint. Then as you start to get consistent, you follow a schedule. Then you can get in a mindset of, okay, let's go back and look at how can I save money? How can I save time? How can I save motion? That's one of the wasted uh, you know, you're looking at lean man manufacturing, there's eight different ways. One of them is motion. That's something as simple as my tape gun. Instead of, you're not going to be able to hear me too well. Let's bring this over here. Instead of my tape gun being away from where I need it, typically when I'm shipping, I put a magnet on the inside of that two by four right there and I can slap my tape gun. So literally during my shipping, I'm, I'm grabbing from right here. I'm not having to reach. I'm not having to where the hell did I, my tape gun go? I'm not having to do any of that, which I used to do a lot of. <laughs> but I also wasted tons of time on small things like that. So then you get into your Sharpies, your pens, your post-it notes, um, your poly mailers. Everything you ship with should be within reaching distance. You shouldn't ever have to go walk across your room to go grab things that you need. It should be right there. If you look into lean manufacturing, Paul Aker's giant warehouse and their staff and how they work, um, you know, it's a manufacturing facility. They have these bays built out where everything is reaching distance. You will never see these guys need to go walk across a room for anything. Um, that's the kind of mindset that you get into that ultimately, like once you make that mindset switch, man, you don't go back. I, I dumb stuff like when I'm brushing my teeth at night, I'm paying attention to like, okay, how far away have I been putting my toothbrush? That's way too, way too far. <laughs> I'm going to put that a little bit closer. I'm going to put toothpaste here. Oh, my toothpicks. I'm always opening a drawer for my toothpicks. Why don't I just have like a little jar right here where I could just reach and grab it, right? Your brain starts to operate in this way and it's, it's a good thing, but uh, it gets to be on a OCD scale uh, sometimes. So that's kind of my my blueprint that I wanted to lay out here for you guys tonight. Um, and I'll get into some quick Q and a for those of you that have questions just in general life reselling, et cetera, feel free to drop those in the comments. Um, that's kind of my loose blueprint that I want to cover tonight is ultimately all of this ties down to create a system 
that provides the service you do. And I know some of you may think, well, I just sell on eBay. Like I thrift, I thrift on the weekends and sell items on eBay. That's not a service. Like, yeah, you, it is. If you don't think selling products is not a service, you need to rework how this, how this is being viewed. You have customers, hundreds of thousands, millions of them on eBay and Amazon that are looking for specific items. You are providing a service by literally being a shopper to go find those items for them and provide them um, with great customer service at a great price um, and hopefully uh, quick shipping and proper shipping, right? Uh, don't skip on the packaging. So you are providing a service. So be in the mindset of create a system that provides that service, not you running the system. Or I'm, I'm sorry, you not just being the sole provider of that service because then the business relies on you. And as long as the business relies on you, you will never be able to step away without something failing. I, I know many of us have been in situations where family, something happens in your family, um, you have an emergency pop up, you get sick, you get an injury, something with your kids comes up and you have to take some time away from your business. What happens? Sales come down, revenue comes down, profit comes down. Sometimes if that causes you to not be able to focus on your business for a few months, tanks. This prime example, this YouTube channel used to produce at least $2,000 a month in revenue. Awesome, right? Loved it because I was consistently showing up and doing two, three, four, five videos a week. Is that a car alarm going off? Hold on. All right. I'm like, is that my car? <laughs> this YouTube channel used to produce several thousand dollars a month in revenue because I was showing up and being consistent with it. We decided we're going to build a prep center. There's all kinds of reasons that went into that, but ultimately we wanted to build a prep center. That took every waking minute of our lives for like a year and a half to get it to where it is now. So what happened? I was not producing YouTube videos, hardly anything on Instagram for at least the last year, year and a half even. So because I had to pull away and I didn't have systems in place for our content for Side Hustle Network, I had zero systems in place for that. The channel relied on me to keep it alive, to produce the videos, to have the content, to uh, you know be consistent with the uploads. There were many ways I could have gone back in time and created systems around that to where it still would have been alive. But no, I went over, all my time was spent on the prep center. So our Amazon business, our eBay business, and YouTube all dwindled down because everything was relying on myself and Trista. No systems. You can't scale that way. You've got to have systems in place or things will dwindle down. So if you are having your business rely on you to, to just keep it alive, let alone grow it, but to, just to keep it afloat, if the business is relying on you, please do yourself a favor and do the steps I just spent the last hour uh, talking about. So you've got to have those systems in place. I really hope at least one person, I know probably about a thousand to 1500 people are going to watch this video, whether it's live or the recording. Uh, if you stuck around for the whole hour, by the way, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know that your time is extremely valuable. So the fact that you, you invested that time into this really, really appreciate you guys being here. So I really hope I get at least one photo of someone's notepad that they just jotted all this stuff down, all the memory or uh, all the ideas that were that were uh, jogged in your mind, all the stuff that got written down. Um, I definitely want to see uh, someone take action with this whole list I just provided here. So my basic outline, create a system that produces the service, not you being the one that needs to provide the service. Don't build the business that relies on you. A lot of this is straight out of the e-myth, by the way. So if you have not read that, that should be step one. Get the e-myth, read that, literally change the entire game plan for our business. Um, if you don't have any systems, just start with the basics. What are the tasks in your business? What are those tasks? So come up with the pillars or whatever terminology you wanna use and then write out a checklist in written form of how you do every single one of those tasks. Then 
one step further, um, no real need for it right away. Written is totally fine if it's just you by yourself. Once you hire staff, having videos going over that checklist and showing people how to do things is going to um, be, be a game changer for you. Once you have that down, create a schedule around that system. What days of the week are you going to source? What days are you going to ship? What days are you going to take your photos? Are you the type that's going to grab five items? Let's say you want to do five, five listings per day. Two different ways I view that is one, you can go grab five items, you know, clean, test, do whatever you need to do, make them look nice, prep, take your photos, sit down, create those listings, upload your photos, boom, five listings done. Or I prefer to do things in batches. So a couple days a week, I have set in my schedule where I'll go take 40, 50 um, this week because we're clearing out the second building. I've been taking upwards of 80, 80 to 90 product photos a day. Um, so I have a huge backlog of photos right on my phone. So now at the end of the night, just get a quick five, five to 10 eBay listings up and I'm good to go. So whether you do things in batches or do them on a daily basis, totally up to you. Just have a schedule to follow. Once you have that down, that gets you to be consistent. And then you can really focus on researching and diving into lean manufacturing and look at what your systems are down to where you stand, where your tape gun is, all that stuff. Then you can work on improving your business. Um, if you want to get a head start, go look up some basic principles about lean manufacturing, watch some videos first before any of this. Then it hopefully gets those wheels turning. So as you make your lists, um, you can start to already think in lean manufacturing terms. <sighs> that was a lot for the hour uh, for some of you. I know this is very basic. For those of you that already have systems and staff and all that, very basic stuff. Um, but I'm just hoping I can, I can help inspire those who maybe are in the position that Tristan and I were in just two years ago. I'm hoping we can help curve a lot of that learning um, and trial and error for you guys. So that's been my take for the night. If you guys have any questions, drop those in the chat and I will answer, spend a couple minutes doing some questions for you. <laughs> How do you reload the tape gun again? Um, I need to try out, I've tried, they're called mousetrap. They're the kind that literally have like the mousetrap metal on here. Um, I need to try some of those again. I, I tried a couple of them back in the day. They were really crappy, like $10 ones, and they sucked. So we get these for free from Uline because we order 48 um, tape rolls. Like every two weeks, we go through about 48 rolls, two to three weeks. Um, so we get a free tape gun. It's just a three-inch tape gun, and this one's called a side loader, Liter literally just from the side. And tape just slides right off the side, and then you just pop the new one on there. So flip this guy. Only issue I have with these, constantly dealing with this, which is why I want to get a mousetrap version. Supposedly they're better. So then you just flip this down, tape roll, slide that through. Good to go. All right, let me scroll up. I'm sure I missed a ton of stuff up here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Gretchen said SKUs. So you can, yeah, definitely input uh, source, buy cost, all that stuff in your SKUs too. If you don't know, and I showed this in my inventory lab series, which three parts are out, I'm, I'm going to edit the fourth one probably tonight and get that pushed out tomorrow. So all four parts of the inventory lab series will be done and uploaded for you guys. Um, so in inventory lab, in the first uh, episode, you can see in the settings how to set up a variable M SKU. Um, that's usually a pretty helpful one for people. Uh, can you talk on some IPI? I've been trying for almost a year and a half to get back over 400, gotten rid of old inventory adjusted sell through, and it's just not working. The IPI is definitely like there's a lot of working factors in that. Um, Larry. Watch me. Amazon has a great video covering that. If you look up his YouTube channel, a great video covering that. Um, James McConnell will also have an article that he wrote, which is awesome. Um, so those are the two reference points I usually refer people to. 
and uh, definitely get that done. I know that one of the biggest factors is sell, like you mentioned, sell through rate. So it's not, you know, clearing out old inventory. Some people say it helps. Some people say it, it doesn't. Um, I personally haven't cleared out old inventory. I just focused on selling things quickly. So things I ship in instead of letting it sit for 30 to 60 days, I'm now like, how can I move this in two to three weeks and take a lower ROI? I saw a big bump in my own IPI score when I started focusing on like two to three weeks sell through. <laughs> Y'all have a good night hustling on to the next job. <laughs> have a good night, Gretchen. I have two eBay pages, one Amazon, one retail store, and I can get two clicking, but I can't get all four running consistent. I may have to have a better schedule. I do work hard, but only when I feel like it. Yeah, that's I, you answered your own thing right there. Uh, not that it was a specific question, but you you nailed it just in your own phrasing. I may have to have a better schedule. I work hard, but only when I feel like it. That just shows I don't see any consistency with that. Um, so, and especially when you're running four different things at one time, you only have so much focus. And when you only have a hundred percent of focus to give, if you're splitting it across four different things, that's going to be a tough thing to juggle. And I covered this in, I think last week's episode or the week before that. Um, but if you focus on building up those two eBay pages and your Amazon and retail store page are also going to dwindle down, then you're doing this like jumping back and forth thing. So literally I, Charles, I would put you in the, in the group of people I would recommend you just follow the checklist I just gave you throughout this last episode is you've got to have structure and in, in a consistent schedule to follow in order to get multiple things going like that. Or the other option too, you know, it's not fun and it's what we've done. I explained it earlier. I had to sacrifice our Amazon, eBay and YouTube channel to make our prep center stupidly successful. And then now that that's 95% outsourced and running smoothly on a system, I then can come back into this world of reselling YouTube um, and all the different backends that come with that. I can now come back and start focusing on that and the prep center is not going to fall. It's going to keep keep doing its thing. So you may be in a position where you need to stop trying to force four things to work and hope that they do and really pick two of those four, focus on those for a bit and then bring the other two in when you're ready. <laughs> that wasted motion comment would make my wife mad as hell. I'm good at that part. She hates it. And like I said, like half the things I say are probably not going to be agreed upon by everyone. And that's totally fine. There's more than one way to build business, to do things. This has just been our own experience. What a great name, the land of liquidations. That's amazing. Hi, I follow you guys. See how much you've been growing. Good job. How how are you manage managing the family and kids and full-time job when you started that? So when we first started, we had Titus. He was one years old when we first started this whole Amazon thing. Um, the hardest part was working in the garage with toys and at one year, one year, they don't know what it means to say this is for eBay and Amazon. Like they don't get that. That was rough. Um, no, ultimately, it's it's going to really hone in on having clear communication. Um, I'm just going to assume spouse is involved. If not, you know, maybe a different conversation. I just know based on Trista and I, um, our experience, having clear cut expectations and communication has been huge. And we've been open about this the whole time. Like as we're juggling both the kids and the job, which for us would be all of this that we run for us, we always had the biggest issues when expectations were, if I wanted to stay late in work and she expected me home at six and I didn't get home till seven, that's a problem, right? Because there was obviously an expectation that wasn't met. And if in my head, I'm like, oh, it's only seven. It's not that late. The kids are still up for another hour and a half. I can play with them. In her head, she may have wanted me home earlier. And this has happened many, many times. And the opposite. She's worked late when I expected her home at a certain time to have family time and dinner together. <laughs> but the better we got at communicating our expectations ahead of time, the the less we dealt with any type of confrontation with each other. And we, I mean, I'm very 
very lucky. Um, I completely understand that. We both feel this way. We talk about it often where we know that it's very rare to have a spouse that's not only supportive, but involved, right? And so we don't take that for granted one bit, um, how lucky we both are to have this together. Um, but ultimately it does come down to those clear cut expectations was a game changer for us. We, we, we don't fight. We don't argue, um, over half the stuff we used to anymore because we on a daily basis are communicating who's doing what, who's doing the, like right now, Titus is seven years old. So he's in first grade and Isla is, um, almost three years old. She'll be three in May. So slightly different setup. So we've got Isla who's got babysitting stuff scheduled out. And then we've got Titus who is first grade. So he's got school schedule, which we've never had to deal with before because we did homeschooling for kindergarten. So having an expectation and communication around his school schedule as a parent has been huge. We, the night before, will set out who's taking him to school because out with our setup, Whoever drops him off is the one that gets to go in and start working uh, at the warehouse early, which is usually something we both prefer. <clears throat> Excuse me. But we're going to communicate with each other the night before. All right, what's the plan for the morning? Who's dropping Titus off? Who's going into work early? He needs to be picked up from school by 3 p.m. So we've got to figure that out too. And as long as we know ahead of time who's doing what, we have no issues. If we wait till the morning of, and my alarm goes off early and then she pops up and she's like, well, I was taking Titus school. You're not like, that's where some issues can pop up. Right. So as far as managing family and kids and full-time job and your Amazon or eBay business, you're reselling, uh, especially I see land of the liquidations you're dealing with pallets, right? That's a whole different ball game, <laughs> clear cut expectations. Um, I don't believe in time management anymore, but as, as far as blocking out certain times. So with kids, it is amazing to me the impact that stopping what you are doing and playing with your kid for 15 or 20 minutes makes. It will literally have such an impact on them. And I, this is a struggle I had for a long time with my boy Titus, especially at seven years old, wild and crazy energy, needs, needs, needs someone to play with. Um, and Isla's not cutting it some days. <laughs> So I used to be in such a bad habit of, you know, by the end of the night, I need to do what everyone else does. I need to scroll social media and unplug my brain, put my feet up and not worry about anything. And then I've got Titus who's like, dad, 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 Legos, 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 like play with me, play with me. I'm like, okay, kid, just give me a minute to rest my, rest my feet, uh, put my feet up. Uh, let me just zone out for a minute and then I'll play with you. And you know, every parent does it, but some nights that playtime did not happen. And then it'd be, oh, I'm just too tired, buddy. I can't run up and down the stairs and uh, play real life Halo with you and all these games he likes to play. And then I learn it only takes 15 or 20 minutes as a parent to give your kid that undivided attention that literally changes that whole dynamic of the relationship. They feel like they don't need to uh, compete with your cell phone, for example. And that's a term that I heard a couple months back and it just hit home. Cause I, I look at it through my kid's eyes now where I can see in today's day and age where it absolutely feels like our kids feel that they need to compete with our phones to get our attention. And when I first heard that several months ago, it made me feel like shit. Cause I, it was true. There are way too many times as a parent that I know I'm just scrolling through my phone when my kids are playing in the living room and I should be a better parent in that moment. But I was so focused on just had a rough day, had a long day. I need to unplug my brain. We all get into the addiction of just like scroll, 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 notification, notification. Ooh, a message. Like we all get into it. No one's perfect here. But that's something that I'm completely fine being transparent about is give your giving your child 15 or 20 minutes of your time. And it changes everything, man. That's all they want is just your attention. They don't want to fight uh, for the time that you're spending on, on the phone. Um, they just want your attention. They're, they're starving for that attention. So if I'm giving any advice based on like the juggling thing with your spouse, your partner, whoever, clear cut communication, expectations from each other, who's doing what at what time, 
with your kids time block, like give them 20 minutes out of, out of uh, your evening. If you don't get home till seven and they go to bed at eight or eight 30, give them 20 minutes, give them 30 minutes, give them some time no matter how tired you are, et cetera, because I've heard uh, too many videos of older people that are interviewed and there's a question that's asked. And this was a few months ago. I first heard this and it just, I've, I've been so in tune with our kids ever since hearing this, um, every, ever since that video just blew my mind almost because of how powerful it was. It was this, these old people are interviewed and they're asked, what were some of the best times of your life? And they all said the same thing, which was when my kids were little and that hit home because that was the moment I realized how much time I was spending on my phone and not giving it to my kids. And I know that as they get older, I'm going to crave having them small and wanting us again. Right. And I'm sure that's something that a lot, you know, my oldest is only seven. Like he's not even that he's still little. Um, but I've been soaking up as much as I can with those two ever since hearing those, those quotes and those phrases come out. So I went on a little like parenting mini podcast episode here. Uh, if you're not a parent, probably got nothing out of that. Hopefully that just gives it, I'm by no means a perfect parent by any means. <laughs> Let me preface with that, but land of liquid liquidations. Hopefully that helps kind of cover my methodology uh, for the kid's situation and juggling it with the spouse and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot and you can try your best and you can get better, but no one's ever going to be perfect. Uh, 2021 Amazon sales. I covered this last week, I think. Uh, yes, there was about 150 K, which was down. I was at 208 the year before, but I mentioned this last, last episode. Um, I'm way more happy with that 150 because I put in less than five hours a month to make that happen versus the 208. I was doing a lot more retail arbitrage, a lot more in the stores. Oh man. What is the single biggest advice for scaling. I, I don't think it's, it's a one thing. It's a combination of a lot. And I think I covered at least in my experience, my opinion, this entire episode was the single biggest thing. It's a combination of, um, making a checklist for everything that you do and outsourcing parts of that system so that you can focus on bigger picture. You can focus on improving and what's the next thing. <laughs> my boy is 15 and dad is no longer cool. <laughs> I feel that with my seven-year-old uh, more and more. It's, man, they get some attitudes on them as they get older. That's for sure. All right, crew. I am going to call it a night. Uh, speaking of blocking out family time, Trista's expecting me home by 545, which is in 20 minutes. So I'm going to hit the road. <laughs> Last, last one I'll pin up here off the topic, but where did you get that Sonic the Hedgehog t-shirt? Shout out to one of my online besties, Ryan from Rally Roots. He actually gifted this one to me uh, for Christmas. So super, super grateful for this piece. Definitely will not be selling this. So I love that shirt. I hit him up on Instagram when it went, went through one of his stories and I'm like, I, I, I need that shirt. Just name your price. I'll, I'll pay it. Uh, so super, super happy for that piece. All right. Let me just pin. I see a couple more pop on here. What's your next goal that you will do or buy that's just for me? Honestly, a truck. Like we're moving down to Texas. I got to get a truck, uh, but not for the sake of owning a truck. Like there's just so many, especially when you're in a prep center and you're hauling shelving and big stuff all the time. Uh, we need one, but more so I've been driving a 2006 Mazda six for the last 
four, I think I bought it 14 years ago. Yeah, this will be year 15. I have been driving the same 2006 Mazda 6 little sedan for almost 15 years. So the next thing that I'm getting for me is I'm getting a truck when we get down to Texas. Um, and then for Tristan and I, we've actually never owned a home. So getting our first home is a huge personal goal of ours. Um, and then once we get those two things checked off, then we get into real estate. That's like the next uh, big business adventure we'll, we'll tackle out. That's all after we get, we need to get a warehouse established down there. We need to get that operation systemized, hire staff. We need to get that fully set up, get ourselves a truck, get a house, then we'll get into real estate. So those are kind of, that's more than one, but the truck would be my own personal uh, thing. And Tristan and I have already talked about that. So she knows that's happening. <laughs> Oh, Seth needs that Sonic shirt too. Sorry, my man. That is not going to be for sale. That is, that's going in what I call my vault. That's my long-term personal collection. Hold on to that. All right, guys. I seriously appreciate you guys for hanging out this entire time. We are at almost an hour and a half. Uh, I truly do love doing these long form um, shows with you guys. I've had so many people that are like, Chaz, I really like your content, but it's way too long. I'm like I get it, but I'm going to do what I enjoy. I, I enjoy talking like a lot of people do, uh, not ashamed to, to admit that. And I love being able to give advice based on our experience and in hopes that it helps some of you that are newer or stuck in some of the trial and error phases we were in a few years ago. And then in a few years from now, I hope I can talk on the ways that we busted through some of the walls that we face now. So definitely appreciate your guys' time for being down here. Have an awesome night and we will see you in the next video. Reminder, we are live every Wednesday, 4 p.m. Pacific time, at least for the next like five to six weeks before we move. Once we get down to Texas and get established, we'll probably have um, a different setup based on school schedules. Titus is involved with karate. So we've got that schedule too. So for the next, at least five or six weeks, Wednesday nights, we will be here. Thank you all for tuning in. Peace out. Have an awesome night.